John Trusino, thanks so much for joining us this Thought Leadership uh, conversation today. Uh, tell us a bit about your background first before we talk about Novavax. So you haven't always been uh, in healthcare. No, I, I haven't been, and it's been kind of an exciting, serendipitous journey for me through, throughout my career in finding a place that I just passionately enjoy working with, within healthcare. But um, I found my way kind of meandering through a variety of different roles, uh, initially finance, uh, business development, um, and then uh, my first entree was in healthcare distribution in the U.S., which was kind of fascinating experience, was learning how the, the back-end mechanics of it work and, the, and then finding my way into, into manufacturing. Uh, 25 years in, in the vaccine space, which has been tremendously rewarding. It's the part of the healthcare business where it's preventive medicine. It's, it's, it's making sure kids don't get sick and adolescents and older adults and and I think for a period of time there, it was a little bit complacent in what people's interests were in vaccines. And over the last, you know, 25 years of me being in, in the vaccine business, it, it's come, come to become quite a focus um, of, of healthcare industry. Clearly enthusiastic with this still. I, we'll talk a little bit more later about the manufacturing side and distribution side, which became so important during the pandemic. But Novavax, tell us what Novavax does, and, and in, uh, particularly in terms of, of the European market as well. Uh, what's your relationship there? You, you, you know, Novavax is, is one of those biotech success stories, right, where you, you have multiple near-death experiences and then realize that everything that you've been doing for the 10 years from a you know, research and discovery perspective and working on a platform technology that we have this uh, and then working in, in the space gives you, gives you an opportunity, um, you know, to really embrace what's, what's happening. I think, I think biotech in general um, is built upon innovation. Um, and I talk about that all the time as I go around the globe, right? So I, I think late stage biotech companies um, who create platform technologies, you know, drive innovation and drive success. And yet it's still got to retain something of that startup entrepreneurial culture. It's a, it's a high risk industry. You're, you're looking at predictive technology as well in terms of where what's going to happen next, where you need to be. Explain to us a little bit about that process, but how you plan uh, for the future in terms of business development and, and innovation. Boy, if you could easily predict, it would be a whole lot easier, right? So you're, 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 you're taking scenarios, right? You're, you're saying, I believe in something that we have that is going to be to the benefit of public health. Um, and then you pursue that with, with passion. And, um, and you go through a process and you do a variety of preclinical work and preclinical -pre trials and you do clinical trials and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And you learn far more from the failures than you do from the successes. Um, and that in some ways is the only way for society in general to be ready for uh, a pandemic. And there's so many lessons learned from that, but I think fundamentally you've got uh, really bright, really well experienced people that are contributing um, intricate and sophisticated science uh, to a cause. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You say that with such ease, and yet if it doesn't work, that's a huge cost burden uh, to carry as well. So the, the risk side of this is, is substantial. And you, you do, what kind of partnerships do you need to make this work? And you, is everything in-house in Novavax? Are you working with partners across Europe, across the globe to, uh, uh, to make uh, this, this market access work? Yeah, so there's the, the product development side of the collaborations, and then there's the execution side. Right, um, and they're it, they're two equally equally important. Right on the de on the development side, you know, science comes from a variety of different places. Um, we have our discovery group that has kind of foundational science about baccalovirus expression systems, so growing a vaccine in insect cells uh, fundamentally, and and where does that science come from? Right, and then you've you've got um, other science that's a, a result of experiments over the course of years, and then you have to ultimately have translational uh, techniques that allow you to take that from the lab and bring it into a manufacturing process. So now you have to have manufacturing expertise in actually um, manufacturing 
those vaccines. I've often used the analogy of it's, it's kind of like the, the test kitchen and you're coming up with new recipes, but ultimately you have to be able to make thousands of, of plates of that. On the execution side, right, you, you now have to have mechanisms by which to get product approved, uh, regulatory challenges and, and hurdles, uh, manufacturing scale up hurdles, distribution hurdles, which is why pro product profile um, for all of the different vaccines, it has a relevance to the, to the process um, as well. Yeah, a lot of the manufacturing uh, elements of this would be in your control to some degree as well. The policy environment, the regulatory environment, to a large degree, isn't within your control. How do you navigate that in a careful and yet a, a business sensitive way? Uh, you, you have to aggressively engage, right? And, and I think um, all, of what, all of what we do, um, all of what we do is um, very science driven, right? And, and even from a, from a policy standpoint, it has to be science. You have to make the compelling argument. So the aggressive part is making sure that those people that are evaluating your vaccine are fully um, aware of, of what is the makeup of, of that vaccine and why it's technologically important. Um, and everybody has a lot of different, their own personal opinions about what they think works and doesn't work but they don't really know, right? They don't know what mRNA really means. They can tell really the difference. Means, right, and, and, but what they do know, and this maybe is the most important thing, right? You're not gonna educate billions of people around the world from a science perspective, but they wanna have some choice, right? There needs to be a portfolio of vaccines available so that people have choice. Choice results in confidence. Confidence results in uptake, right? And uptake re results in minimizing disease. So all of these factors come into play as, as we execute against this strategy. But also on the supply side as well, you know, we saw bottlenecks emerging during the pandemic where there was an over-reliance on, on uh, one vaccine or another at different times. Uh, so this, this diversity of, of portfolio of vaccines uh, that, that must be on the market. Uh, do you think policymakers have learned these lessons uh, through, through the pandemic or are we in a, a fatigue stage where they're, they're just like, it's over, let's not worry about that now? Everybody's fatigued a bit at the moment, right? So every, uh, everybody's taking a deep breath and saying, I don't have to wear my mask anymore. I, my travel doesn't have to be restricted. You know, so I'm, I'm less concerned about what's happening. So I think the policymakers are fatigued as well. And, and I think, I think, um, I always like to say that fear is a big driver about vaccine confidence. <laughs> the moment that people are fearful of the consequences of that circulating virus, uh, they're gonna make sure that they, they get vaccinated. So all of these factors come into play, right? Educating the policy makers, educating the general public, and making sure that it's continuously front of mind. Uh, Novavax works on a lot of different uh, areas for, for vaccines. Yeah, in terms of how public uh, planning is done, for the, the next wave of, of uh, disease, you know, you have you you can't predict exactly what's going to happen. But the processes that we have seen fail and processes we've seen work during uh, the COVID pandemic, what lessons have really been learned that you think are going to stay in place regardless of fatigue, regardless of complex issues to do with uh, procurement and so on? Yeah, there there are several, and and obviously we we think about it all the time because. Novavax at its heart and soul is a um, respiratory disease vaccine company, right? Um, so that's what we are, that's what we do. We're a vaccine company and, and we're intent upon focused on infectious diseases. And there are known infectious diseases today. There are emerging infectious diseases that, that need, that require surveillance. And so lessons learned are surveillance continues to be critically important paying attention to known emerging infectious diseases are critically important. Having pla platform technologies that you know are adaptable to certain pathogens. Having the manufacturing capacity um, scaled and ready and where it needs to be throughout the globe. It became quite a significant issue about borders closing and nationalistic activities um, and not having equitable distribution. So you think we're in a better place now than we were at the start of the pandemic if we take a public health approach for how we deal with crisis in the future? Uh, well, first I'd say it was an, a Herculean effort and accomplishment of what did get done in this year. I mean, it's, it's always easy to kind of criticize it could have been done better, but what was done was frankly amazing. 
uh, for everybody's role, whether it was the first line res first responders or whether it was the vaccine manufacturers or whomever was involved in the pandemic did an amazing job. But there's no question, there's always lessons learned about how we can do it better. I think um, manufacturing capacity was one of them. Uh, warm base manufacturing capacity, which we've been talking about for years for uh, flu pandemics. Um, we thought about it and we tried to implement it and there was a little bit of that, but not nearly enough of it. Um, another important factor is uh, uh, regulatory harmonization, right? Um, you know, you, you have to go almost country by country to get a vaccine approved. Boy, is that slow. And in terms of Europe, how has that changed? Has this path become easier uh, for companies like Novavax to, to deliver uh, for the European uh, citizens as well because of the regulatory environmental changes? Yeah, so our relationship with Europe and the European Commission was tremendously successful. I mean, um, I think some of the challenge came down to that, that each country still reserved the right to do and make some of those decisions, which of course they have the right to do that and should but it created a little bit of a layer of, of, of challenge. Uh, with, with Brexit, you know how to deal with the UK separately than, than the EU, and, and, and that then created just another layer of activity. Does it help that you have a presence in Europe as well? You have a Czech facility, is that right? Well, we didn't, right? On, on day one, we were kind of like a, a standing store, right? We didn't have a manufacturing facility. In that very first year, uh, Novavax had 100 people in January of, of 2020 and no manufacturing capacity, right? We had small, you know, um, lab scale work that was being done. Um, and a couple of things happened pretty quickly, right? The, the U.S. government pointed us in the direction of a couple of contract manufacturers in the U.S. A few months later, we actually acquired the facility in the Czech Republic located in Bohemil, um, um, which is now up and running, but it's taken us some time to do that. It's quite a sophisticated facility. It needed to complete its renovations and modernization. But nonetheless, we have a, a great facility there. And what excites you about that facility, though? It's, it's, you've invested in it. Uh, as uh, some would say, well, you were a bit late. You've just come out of the pandemic. But actually, we haven't come out of the pandemic. We're, we still have this in, in, in the background, even if it's just a little quieter. Right. You're, Europe, like most countries, likes having manufacturing you know, in country. And so I think there's an advantage there. Um, it's a facility we're going to be able to use well into the future. Um, and you know, what are the rest of the things that we're doing in, in Europe? In, in addition to that facility, we have an adjuvant manufacturing facility um, in Uppsala, Sweden. Uh, we have our commercial infrastructure being built out of Zurich, and we have a policy and government affairs team that's in Brussels. We now have more people in Europe than we have in any other location ar around, around the globe. And, and I think that um, it's, it's important to say that European presence for us is important. Uh, the role that we're playing within European public health is important, and so we're kind of here to stay. And just in terms of some of this you already touched on, but having access to vaccines and how governments can ensure that citizens have access to vaccines, to your mind, what's the most important element of that now? Uh, so access is being where people will go to get vaccinated, right? Even in middle-income countries and even in low-income countries, there should be a resource available, a clinic somewhere that someone could go to and get vaccinated. There's no reason that, that anyone around the world should not have ease of access to a vaccine and choice of which vaccine they want. And just finally, on leadership, the lessons that you've seen, observed, uh, during uh, this crisis and throughout your career as well. What does leadership uh, look like in, in the pandemic? What are the, the key elements uh, that you think are, are to be held up as an example of next time we should do it like this? So maybe this is a function of my kind of entrepreneurial spirit and, and thinking, but always having a vision of success, right? We, you, you challenged me before about being okay with the, the roller coaster and the failures. And, and leadership accepts the fact that it's not going to be perfect right out of the gate, right? You, you've got to have a talented team of people. Uh, you have to have diversity of, of opinion and experiences. Um, you have to be passionate about what you're doing, and you have to really believe that, that success is part of, of, your, of your future and that you're going to be responsive to whatever comes in your direction. 
So from a leadership standpoint, you engage with the community of people around the globe, um, whether it's political leaders or vaccine leadership or scientific leadership, and you network with those folks and you collaborate with those folks um, and you come out with a better result. John Trezino, thank you. Thank you.